Okay, I see by the clock on the wall, it's three o'clock, a call to order the Board of Directors study session uh, meeting for uh, Thursday, July 14th, 2022. Could I have a roll call, please? Director Grasha. Here. Director Sewell. Here. Director Duncan. Here. Vice President Wright. Here. President Martin. Here. Thank you, we have quorum. <clears throat> And moving on to item five, public input. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address the board on matters within the board's jurisdiction. Please limit comments to three minutes or less. State law prohibits the board from discussing or taking action on any item not listed on the agenda. Do we have anybody wishing to make public uh, comments today? President Martin, we do not have anyone for a public comment at this time. Okay. Um, moving on to item six, <clears throat> human resources report. Pardon? That, well, that will be on um, Monday. Okay, Monday. Usually wait and do that on Monday. All right. Moving on to item seven, resolution 2022-17, which is amending resolution number 2021-18, revisions to Mission Springs Water District personnel rules and regulations. It is recommended to adopt resolution 2022-17, providing for the re uh, revisions to Mission Springs Water District personnel rules and regulations. Arden? Okay, I'm gonna let uh, Oriana cover this. This is something that we do at least once a year, it seems like lately, because uh, we have uh, different laws that change and that basically is reflected in, in the necessity to change our personnel rules. And okay. so we're gonna do that and I'll let Oriana Oriana, go ahead. Move forward with that. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Martin and members of the board. As it is our regular practice, and in order to ensure that the district is in full compliance with laws implemented by the state and federal agencies, the district council and I regularly review and revise the personnel rules and regulations. The last employee um, update, employee handbook update was in December of 2021. And the revisions to the personnel rules and regulations we bring before you today include updates to existing policies to comply with the law or to clarify policy language. In addition, we are including an education and certification incentive pay, um, rule 39, it is a new rule. Um, and this was added to encourage and reward continuous learning for certifications and education, which will better prepare the district's workforce to assist and serve the customer's needs. Exhibit A in your packet outlines the updates to the personal rules and regulations. Um, however, there are some updates being made um, to what is in your current packet. And I would like to draw your attention to the last page of Exhibit A, so I can point those out to you. Um, rule 35, we are updating the first sentence to read. It is the intent of the district to maintain a workplace that is free of drugs and alcohol consumption during work hours. Um, rule 39, we're updating. We are striking um, AA. We're only going to incentivize bachelor's degree. Those are the only two updates which will be reflected um, on Monday's packet. Also, the staff report will be updated to reflect a fiscal impact of $30,000 for the certification pay, which is already included in the current fiscal year budget. So we are not requesting any additional funds. That's all I have, and I'm open for questions. Okay. Any questions from the board concerning the uh, the item at hand? I have one. Yes, Randy, go ahead. And this is really just a technicality. Mm. On Rule 35, um, Intended District Maintain a Workplace, blah, 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 that is free of the inappropriate use of drugs. Does this, so that people can take their antihistamines or their antibiotics for their prescription drugs without... I mean, is that what that is? Yes, right. that, that is the intent. We are um, updating that language um, to read the consumption. 
of drugs and alcohol. But yes, that is absolutely the intent. We don't want to penalize people that for mm. medical reasons are required to take medicine. Okay, okay. Right. On, that, on that point, uh, it was a good question. Um, a lot of prescription drugs do have impairment uh, with they say on the prescription, for example, you can't operate a motor vehicle or something like that. And I'm wondering, uh, um, should they be be asked to disclose uh, such restrictions? Uh, how how do you handle how do you handle that? Well, typically, when we know that is the case, yes, staff is required to disclose, and then we seek to make an accommodation that will allow the employee to work around that. Um, but yes, we certainly don't want the staff driving while they're sleepy. But I mean, how would we know that unless they came forward and divulged that information? They will have to come forward and divulge that I information. Okay. We have no access to their medical records, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nancy, Ivan, no. Director Grasha? Uh, I have no questions on this, but before you move on to the next item, I have a point of order and a request for clarification from legal counsel on the standing of uh, one former director that seems to be still sitting on the board uh, in violation of the uh, district attorney's uh, determination that he vacated his seat. Okay, uh, our counsel isn't here today. Uh, would it be a Appropriate for you to uh, uh, to wait until uh, Monday when the council is present to ask that question. Uh, it's not a question. It's a clarification from council. I'm sure. Well, that's okay. Clarification. Uh, well, you know, we have a letter here stating that the uh, office has been vacated. It was declared by the district attorney. Apparently, there's been multiple uh, uh, acts of. Uh, uh, perjury that are associated with that haven't been charged and I'm wondering if his continually sitting on the board will activate those charges and uh, smear the reputation of this district and I think it's time before we continue on with this meeting to uh, address that as a board and uh, not pretend that uh, this is not an elephant sitting in the room I find it offensive that this is happening right now okay thank you for your uh, for your input uh, director uh... Excuse me, General Manager Wallen, do you have any come? I don't think we're voting on anything today. So. Okay, yeah, we're not voting on any issue today, so it's kind of a moot point, but we can address that issue on Monday if you if you like. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to read into the record and I'll provide this document that was addressed to the Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was addressed to the Board of Directors and I never received it from the district, which was uh, uh, Interesting. I had to receive it from a reporter during a questioning about your actions at the previous board meeting. So if you don't mind, so to just to clarify any misunderstandings that was created by this board and their action last month. Let me just read this letter and I'll provide it like I said. Well, we're not going to take the well, time to read the entire letter. We've well, all received think, the letter. I think it's imperative that the public and the staff understand what uh, what is going on here. It, uh, you, you tried to confuse the issue last month. We spent an entire month uh, waiting for a clarification that never came. And here we sit uh, pretending that this is uh, legit and it's not. It's been declared vacant. Wait until you're recognized. So let me read. The Riverside County District Attorney's Office has received a request to investigate a substantial violation by Director Randy Duncan of his residency requirements of the Mission Springs Water District Board Director pursuant to Water Code 30508. The complaint alleges that Mr. Duncan no longer lives in the division he was elected to represent. Such a violation may jeopardize the finality of actions taken by the board since violation occurred, which is nearly two years ago. According to the Mission Springs Water District website, Mr. Duncan was most recently appointed to the board in October of 2014, after having served on the board for a few years prior. The website also mission, mis mentions that Mr. Duncan has lived in Desert Hot Springs for more than 25 years. Our office recently learned that Mr. Duncan no longer resides within the Mission Springs Water District, having purchased a home outside of California while Mr. Duncan used to live in, uh, in Desert Hot Springs within the district, 
we determined that he sold that residence upon purchasing a new home out of state. We also discovered that Mr. Duncan stays with a friend in Desert Hot Springs about four days a week, but that friend's residence is not within Mr. Duncan's water board district. Mission Springs water board of directors must reside within their respective divisions. If the director moves out of their division, they are deemed to have vacated their position if they fail to establish residency, proper residency within 180 days. This is codified in water code 30508. If a director's place of residence as defined in section 244 of the government code is moved outside the district boundaries or outside of the boundaries of the director's division, where elected from a division or within 180 days of the move of the effective date of this section, the director fails to reestablish a residence within the district or within the director's division, it shall be presumed the permanent change of residence has occurred and that vacancy exists on the board of directors. A place where one remains for labor or special or temporary purpose does not qualify as a place of residence and a person may only have one residence. Therefore, neither Mr. Duncan's out-of-state residence nor his temporary stays at a friend's residence outside the district would constitute qualifying residences for the purpose of compliance with Water Code Section 3058. Without a qualifying residence within the district, Mr. Duncan vacated his position as director of the Mission Springs Water District, according to government code, 1770. Mr. Duncan's position became vacant when he ceased to be an inhabitant of the district for which he was appointed and within which his duties of his position are required to be discharged. Based upon the facts as we understand them, our legal analysis has concluded that Mr. Duncan's current position as a Mission Springs Water District Board member constitutes a clear violation of 30508 water code. The district attorney of Riverside County is committed to the objective ensuring that the board of directors of public agencies are qualified to hold their position of office and uphold the integrity of the board's actions. To that end, we respectfully request the board comply with the law by officially vacating Mr. Duncan's position as of the date he moved outside of his district, which was nearly two years ago, I'll add. We also request the board review prior actions that were taken during the violation period and to ensure that you were in compliance with quorum majority requirements set forth in Water Code 30525 and 30523. Failure to appropriately remedy this matter may result in further action taken by the district attorney's office. And I would add, I think that you need to really consider uh, turning your nose up at the district yeah. attorney's office, considering that there's multiple felonies involved in the perjurious uh, s signatures to documents declaring that. I'm going to cut you off now. You're, you're, you're okay. editorializing. First of all, I want to make two points and then we're going to move on. First of all, Director Grasha has not been convicted of any offense. These are merely uh, of avenues of investigation that the uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, Director uh, Director Duncan has not been convicted of any offense, and these are merely charges that they are they, they looked at, um, and, and I'm not prepared to discuss that because he hasn't had his uh, time in court. May I also remind you that, uh, like uh, Director Duncan, uh, you, Mr. Grasha. Uh, uh, are facing charges, uh, or investigation, I should say, with the Attorney General's office for a very similar offense. So if we're going to have him withdraw from the meeting, then then you would uh, follow suit. But until you have your day in court, until the investigation is completed, um, he's going to sit here until, uh, until uh, counsel advises uh, otherwise. So with that, we're going to move on to um, item eight. Resolution 22-18, Resolution of the Board of Directors of the Mission Springs Water District, proclaiming a local emergency persists, re-ratifying the proclamation of a state of emergency by executive order 
N is Nora 09 21 and reauthorizing remote teleconference meetings of the legislative bodies of the Mission Springs Water District for the period July 23rd, 22 to August 22nd, 2022, pursuant to the provisions of the Ralph M. Brown Act. That's a pretty standard and self explanatory. Uh, does anybody have any comments they want to make on resolution uh, listed on item eight? Anybody? I see none. Moving on to item nine, resolution 2022-19 conflict of interest code update. It is recommended to adopt resolution number 2022-19, uh, amending the Mission Springs Water District conflict of interest code. Arden? Okay. Uh, excuse me, this is quite self-explanatory. Nothing more to say other than we've changed through the class comp. Um, some positions and staffs assigned to those positions uh, have changed. And so we're basically recognizing that change. Okay. All right. Any questions from the board? Ivan? Director Russia, any questions? No questions. Thank okay. You. All right. Moving on to item 10. Various agreements related to the rehabilitation of the Horton Wastewater Treatment Facility, the North Building. Is recommended to authorize the general manager to enter in to an appropriate, into the appropriate agreements to facilitate the rehabilitation of the Horton Wastewater Treatment Facility, the North Building. This uh, rehabilitation includes construction and upgrades for two bathrooms, kitchen and office space for the water and collections department. The agreements necessary to complete the rehabilitation are with Puro Clean for 26,000. Somebody hit it. I'm sorry, what? Anyway, Pearl Clean um, for $26,582.36 for roofing, High Desert Air for $18,250 for air conditioning, Cove Electric for $35,945.62 electrical update, upgrades, and uh, SW Plumbing for $18,745 uh, for additional plumbing. For plumbing. Um, General Manager Wallen, do you have anything further? No, other than the fact that, uh, you know, I, th I think part of this was was because of the the uh, pandemic and, and, you know, getting most of this work done, which was initiated at the time. Brian will go through the details here <clears throat> on this. Actually, we'll turn it over to Eric Weck, our engineering manager. He has a short yes. presentation for you. Okay. Good afternoon, President Martin and members of the board. This afternoon on your agenda, it's item number 10. It's the uh, Horton Wastewater Treatment Facility North Building Rehabilitation and Remodeling Project. Um, currently, the space that this building is north of the laboratory building, and that'll come in to the presentation later. So currently, the space at the North building is used for storing chemicals and other ancillary items. And it's not really being maximized right now. So by doing this project, uh, we, we went through it and we identified a few things that need to be done. And uh, one of the goals is to repair and re-roof the, the facility. And we're gonna do that first. That's gonna be item number one. Uh, the next is that we're going to renovate an existing shower and restroom area. And uh, I've got some existing photos of these uh, locations that I'm going to be speaking about. And so my goal here is to give you uh, a roadmap of where we're going to go. And then when the project is done, I will come back to the board and show you before and after photos uh, and show you the improvements that were made. So likewise, we're also gonna construct a new shower and a new restroom in a unused, underutilized space in the building. And uh, then we're gonna get some electrical upgrades to accommodate these improvements and replace the existing swamp cooler with a two-stage, one single two-stage air conditioning unit. So what are the benefits? Well, we're gonna provide dedicated and usable workspace for the wastewater staff. Currently, wastewater staff and laboratory staff are sharing the same building. And so that makes it for cramped work quarters. 
And what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the wastewater staff over into the north building that'll be renovated and we'll provide enough workspace and uh, elbow room for both wastewater staff and laboratory staff. And we're also in the north building we're gonna <laughs> provide a dedicated break and meeting area for the staff so that they conduct uh, trainings and workshops. Um, and then finally, we're gonna maximize uh, an underutilized space by constructing a new restroom and a shower facility. So these are the existing site photos of the North Building. The one on the left shows the current existing shower and restroom. All joking aside, if you use that shower right there as it is, you need to step outside just to change your mind. So we're gonna remove that shower facility and also take out that water heater that's there and install a new shower unit that's bigger, that has more room. That water heater will be replaced by a tankless water heater. And in this, in this um, room here, there's gonna be also some minor plumbing uh, modifications. Now you'll see on the photo on the right with the existing roof damage, uh, that's why we reached out to Puro Clean. Uh, that's one of the quotes that we received for repairing this roof. And what you see here is ceiling damage, but there's also some damage in the internal uh, ceiling area that needs to be fixed. So that's what we're uh, seeking to do. Finally, uh, this is the existing kitchenette area that is in the North building. We're going to repurpose that space to have a locker room and uh, the appliances that are there now, the um, ice machine and the refrigerator will be moved to the bigger room that's beyond that door there. Um, and so they'll have, uh, they'll relocate the microwave, the uh, refrigerator and the ice machine there. And um, they'll be able to also have a uh, workspace uh, in that area. And uh, next is what I'm excited about. This is an unused room in the North building. We're gonna completely transform this into a shower uh, and restroom room uh, to uh, allow more staff to use this and clean up before heading home. And that door will obviously be taken care of, um, but we're gonna, so in that right picture, you'll see uh, the after picture in a couple months when I come back and show the board that uh, you'll see a new uh, shower facility restroom and a lavatory. So um, that is basically it in a nutshell, other than uh, staff has reached out to multiple vendors to uh, obey the procurement process here for the district. And the quotes that we received are the ones that uh, we were able to get from available contractors that were willing to do the work. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions? Uh, he answered the ones I had. Okay, and uh, Nancy, any no. questions? No, no questions, but gee, that, that looks really great. I, I'm kind of excited about that shower area too for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really great. Yeah. <laughs> Ivan, any questions? Uh, Director Brasha, any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a couple of questions in regarding the bid process uh, and this uh, project. I, I'd like you to report to the board on uh, how many uh, people were invited to bid, who those bidders were, and how this went, made it through the process, and why it seems to be so split up in so many uh, different directions that it makes it confusing for a director to follow it. Uh, maybe you could address that. Yes, sir. So initially, what we wanted to, what I was interested in doing is putting together a complete bid package and bidding it out. Um, with summer coming up, I wanted to have these improvements done as soon as I could so that uh, the air conditioning unit and all these improvements can be done um, at, least, at least as soon as we can. I know we probably won't be able to make, we're not gonna make the summer timeframe. So we decided to split it up. And in doing so, we, we invited, I don't have the exact numbers, but we did. Uh, I can share with you an email that I received from our plan operator 
who coordinated uh, getting a hold of all those different other vendors that were not interested. And um, staff met with uh, them and the, the folks that were interested. We got the quotes and uh, Director Grasha, I will be more than happy as, as well as the board to provide that email as, as backup. Um, the intent is to get this, these improvements completed um, as expeditiously as possible uh, so that uh, wastewater staff and can in, in enjoy a, um, a space that's air conditioned and uh, that they can work in. In, in addition to the, uh, to the email you're gonna send out, could you go over uh, the number of people that were contacted to, to, to answer Director Grush's questions and uh, divulge that information on Monday so that the public uh, is, uh, is aware of, uh, of the process? Yes, Director uh, okay. Martin. The, the reason I, I asked the question is it's uh, been a long time since I've been active in the construction business, but with some experience along those lines, it, it seems to me that uh, job splitting is against uh, uh, California code. And it, sometimes it uh, gets confused with, uh, uh, you know, agencies like this tend to get away with whatever they want and not, not pay much attention to what the law actually says we've experienced that this now for the second time today uh, so i'd like you to take take a good hard look at uh, whether or not you're splitting those jobs in violation of uh, a public contract code thank you good we, we yes uh, uh, I, I just I, I mean we, we we understand that and that's what we're doing is to be sure that the board knows exactly what we're doing and we are trying to get, you know, we'd, we'd follow that procurement policy very closely, but these are broken down where they're not required through the process, but I wanted you to be still aware of the fact that we did not get a complete package, so we needed to break it down like this. Okay. Okay, anything from the rest of the board else? Okay. Evan, anything? Okay. Moving on to item 11, First Amendment to contract with uh, Runau Clark Architects for the design of the Critical Services Center Administration Building. It is recommended to authorize the general manager to amend the professional services contract with Runau Clark Architects for the design of the Critical Services Center Administration. The amendment would increase the contract amount 788,764 from 1,000,000. 72,200 to a not to exceed amount of 1,860,964 and authorize the general manager to do all things necessary to complete the project. General Manager Wall. Um, yeah, I'll let Brian introduce the representatives from Unu Clark, which will give you a presentation informing you of the, okay. the, the changes. Okay. Good afternoon. President Martin, members of the board, staff. Uh, yes, this project has evolved uh, significantly since the first fee and scope of this project was brought to you last July. The original contract was based on the design of a critical services center administrative building at either the potential property purchase located just off of Palm Drive or the current corporate yard. Uh, after much consideration and discussion by the board, the critical services center, the administrative building, uh, is now to be constructed on property that is owned by Mission Springs Water District uh, at Two Bunch Palms Trail. Currently, the district is considering a full built-out development, which includes not only the administrative building, but a new maintenance facility with three vehicle bays, parking areas, solar canopies, walkways, and a conservation garden. As such, Renewal Clark Architects has requested this amendment for their design services for the fully built-out development. Uh, that is the action item before us today. Before I start with the discussion on this specific amendment, with the board's uh, permission, I would like Renew Clark to give the presentation and, and update everybody and move up the item that's later in the agenda to now so it sort of brings it all together. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. With that being said, uh, I believe Mr. Clark is on the line to uh, give a presentation. Good afternoon. I'm actually going to ask Alvin Flores, who's been... Uh, uh, intimately involved in the planning of this. Uh, 
and so I don't want to steal this thunder for this project, but we're excited about where we're going with this. And so Alvin, could you make the presentation and then I'll comment if I feel like it's necessary. And all right, I uh, just want to make sure everyone can see uh, my screen I'm sharing currently. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you very much. So jumping into it, uh, quick agenda. Overall, we're going to go through uh, the site plan quickly, but mostly the bulk of the presentation will be jumping into the interior portion of the building, presenting kind of some of the concepts. Um, our earlier presentations have outlined our overall design and um, kind of working from the site to maybe the exterior of the building. And then now we're going to kind of dive into that um, interior design a little bit more to give everyone a better idea. So, but as I was mentioning first, we'll kind of go over uh, the site plan. So not much has changed here from, I believe the last presentation that Brian uh, presented to the board. Uh, what we've continued to do is refine the design of the site. Um, I think one of the major comments that we had previously was making sure that the staff parking was moved behind the fence. So there's some added security for that. Uh, the only thing outside of that is defining uh, the location of a trash enclosures, uh, some EV charging stations for future um, infrastructure. And um, again, just kind of refining uh, the general layout to, to make things work a little bit tighter. Um, I know in terms of uh, solar and whatnot. Uh, we're definitely working with the district on that to find uh, the most appropriate way to bring solar to the campus, um, uh, whether that's through a PPA, working with Southern California Edison, or other me methods in order to help uh, in terms of funding. And um, on our side, uh, the big thing that we'll make sure we coordinate is the infrastructure, making sure that whatever uh, infrastructure is necessary, power, conduits and whatnot, uh, can be provided to those uh, solar campings, whether they happen early in the project or if they're going to happen further down the road, depending on how funding occurs. Uh, the other portion that we're working with the district is the demonstration gardens. Um, I believe Brian just mentioned to me uh, earlier that uh, he was able to allocate some additional grant funding for that. So I think that's another piece that uh, we're trying to find additional funds to help uh, make sure that that uh, vision, you know, occurs for the site. There jumping into uh, the interior concepts, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a, a sheet that we presented earlier that kind of gives your um, an idea of the overall palette for the project, the color palette, uh, mentioned some of the materials uh, and also some of the fixtures and um, other pertinences that we're looking at um, to add into the building. And from here, uh, this is kind of our vision of how those are gonna be laid out within the building. So the, that color palette that uh, we had presented previously, this is um, it implemented into the building. Uh, the general idea here is that uh, each area, so in this case, this is the executive area, um, and this one would be the customer service um, administrative area, have very distinctive, uh, a distinctive color palette. So as you are traversing through the space, when you're in the space and you move to a different space, you do feel that difference and you have a, a sense of place as to where you are. So moving further into the building, this is uh, the engineering area and then further to the side will be the operations area. So you can kind of see that distinctive color palette um, being distributed throughout the site uh, or throughout the building. And again, that gives you a sense of place as you're working through the building. Um, and uh, basically also in terms of visitors and whatnot, makes it easier for them to be able to see, you know, which department they're in uh, as they're going through. And again, kind of giving everybody a sense of place. Uh, we do have um, some geometric patterns that are also um, being taken in from the cues from the exterior design. Uh, so we do have some uh, geometric uh, patterns that uh, are reflected in the overhang on the exterior of the building. And those types of concepts um, are also being brought into the building, in this case, the floor plan. Um, and you'll see a couple more other uh, areas that we also have that implemented in. Here. Um, so aside from the color palette on the floor, basically, as you move up the walls, there's other elements that we're looking at to um, add some 
another sense of place or actually even bringing in uh, aspects of the district in terms of the history, uh, maybe some archival photos and having that spread throughout the, the building. So as you enter into the lobby, what we're looking at is having graphics on the wall that um, are representative of maybe either the topographic um, area of uh, the Mission Springs Water District, um, also probably highlighting some of the aspects of water uh, on the walls, again, kind of giving an opportunity as people enter the building to kind of get a, a nice introduction as to, you know, who the district is, what they serve, and um, as we get further in, you'll see some more specifics to that too. Um, and as I mentioned earlier too about the geo, uh, geometric patterns, uh, there are also other materials that we have scattered throughout the site that kind of, again, kind of bring that concept from the outside into the building to, to make some uniform concepts and uh, kind of show that strong design. Um, other elements on the wall, you know, we can also do uh, graphics and with verbiage to again help uh, with wayfinding or help understand kind of where you are maybe the purpose of this space um, and also uh, outside of that maybe using some other accent colors again to bring a little bit more um, focus to certain areas uh, within the, the building we also take this oh. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, for let's zoom in a little bit on this guy. So, as you enter the lobby, again, this is one concept that we're looking at is having a wall graphic. Uh, in this case, that has contours um, that kind of show the, the land massing and some of the. We can also, like I mentioned earlier, bring in some of uh, the water features um, that are related to the district. And in this case, I know that this is one of the um, phrases that are, is used in you know district literature and on their website so again finding opportunities to scatter to that throughout the building again to you know illustrate to the community um, and also the site staff kind of what important values that the district wants to show and again this is just a sample of what could be used we can always change it add it or revise it to anything else that the district feels the other aspect of the lobby is the reception desk. So as of now, this is our first pass at trying to provide something that um, first off provides like a central place for everyone to go to. Everyone knows that, you know, this is the reception area, but also providing a little bit of visual interest. Again, those, that geometric pattern and um, that color palette, bringing that into uh, the desk and also, you know, providing some level of security um, but not making it feel completely enclosed or completely separated. Um, so that way there, there can be that interaction, but there is uh, a level of security uh, that we're trying to provide, but not make it feel like too, it's too overbearing. The other elevation that we're exploring is the boardroom. So right here, what you see is uh, the board dais. And then behind this, uh, we're looking at a stone wall with uh, metal panels and then trying to bring the district graphic onto that. And then use various materials here to help elevate uh, the space and um, provide a nice background to you know, focal point for um, board meetings and or other meetings that the district would have in this space. Um, when it comes to the ceiling, uh, again, bringing in a lot of those materials, uh, some of the geometric patterns, uh, using fi various fixtures to generate interest within the spaces um, and help uh, elevate the spaces. Uh, also using the ceiling to help uh, define the different areas. So again, as you're walking down this hallway, you know that you are passing from one department and kind of making your way to a different department, or in this case, kind of drawing you into uh, this loud lounge and shared space. Um, again, just trying to generate some interest, but also provide a little bit of wayfinding um, to staff and to visitors to the site. Uh, the exterior elevations, we've, we've presented this previously. And as I mentioned, we do have some of these geometric elements that we're showing on the exterior, uh, along with that uh, 
color palette and bringing that into the building. Uh, what we're showing here is a little bit more specifics as to uh, what those colors are uh, and what those materials are. So we can go with those more detailed if one wants, but we have presented this in the past. And again, just kind of rounding out the presentation with uh, some of the exterior uh, perspectives that we've shown in previous presentations. So. And from there, I can open up for any questions or comments. Okay, hey, Director Grusha, do you have any good questions or comments? Okay, um, Director Sewell, do you have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I, I think all the um, mm -hmm. materials and different surfaces that you have look great. Um, my only question is like the copper panels and some of the other panels, are those going to be more expensive to maintain and to clean? I'm just worried about, um, I mean, they're gonna look nice uh, day one, but 10 years down the road, is it gonna be something that would tarnish or things like that? I'm just not familiar. Oh. Understood. Um, all the materials that we look at, we do our best to make sure that they can, um, for lack of a better word, take a punch. You know, we, we know that this building is uh, going to be used for, you know, public and or for many years by the site staff. So we do want to make sure that everything's well maintained um, and easy to maintain on top of that. So um, there are certain materials that will weather better than others. And um, I think uh, a lot of the board members have visited East Valley. And again, that's kind of the level of finish that we're aiming for for this project. And that project, I think, is held together very well throughout the years. And we're using that same design aesthetic, that design eye, and kind of our experience with those types of materials. So we'll do our best to maintain that. And we'll work very closely with uh, Brian and his staff, too, in terms of if you know their staff has any specific uh, quibbles with certain materials or have had issues in the past. But, um, but we are doing our best to find ones that uh, can be easily maintained and that will last. OK, thank you. Director Duncan, any questions or comments? No, it looks good. I'm, it looks like it's coming along nicely. Vice President Wright, any questions or comments? Um, just had a just a comment on uh, dark carpeting in high traffic areas. I wasn't sure. I saw some. It looked like black carpeting. I just wanted to, um, yeah. Um, I know that in our desert, the, the dirt is light colored and the little rocks that get stuck in your shoes and stuff. I just was wondering if a dark uh, carpeting would be, you know, okay, maybe in non-traffic areas, but that's just me just asking. Um, whenever we do have transitions onto carpet from the exterior, we um, always put uh, some kind of walk-off mat. So it'll basically kind of capture that dirt in that one area before you transition into, we'll call it the, the higher level finish. So that's one way we try to uh, mitigate any of those types of um, issues. But um, yeah, I think maybe the boardroom might be the only area that we have currently uh, that has that potential. Everywhere else, we do have a, a hard surface uh, coming in from the outside. And again, that's us balancing the boardroom aesthetic, wanting to be a little bit higher level than other spaces. But again, we can help mitigate uh, those types of... Okay, um, and distance. I know they're little tiny samples, you know, so they <laughs> maybe a much bigger piece would be more of a lighter gray, maybe not totally black like some yep. of it kind of looks. So, uh, yeah, okay, thanks. I think this yeah. could, could I be could comment. white carpet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can also, white carpet would be worse, as yeah. <laughs> President Martin said, so. <laughs> I think this is rendering it a little darker than it really is, and I think one of the things with a dark color flooring material like that or a dark color carpet is it actually shows dirt less uh, than, than a, <laughs> no, than a lighter too. product. Yeah, as long as it's got a marbling or something to it, right. so that would probably be a, Correct. Be, be work out better. Exactly. Yeah, and we'll provide samples as well. So, um, so you you will have that another opportunity because just like Roger was mentioning, sometimes when you're looking out of the screen, the color does come off a little bit differently. But we'll make sure we provide those samples too, and we can kind of dial that in. Anything further from our general manager? No, but. It does look like a lot of thought is going into this, and that's yeah. what we need. We're going to live with this for a long time. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I think your staff has a, a lot to say about the colors too. So I kind of leave it I leave it up to you guys. Uh, you're going to have to live with it and work with it. So, you know, I, I like the colors. I'm not complaining about it. Just to let you know. Okay. Uh, anybody after reviewing the uh, 
the uh, agenda packet. If you have any additional questions, they can bring them up on uh, on Monday. Okay. Moving on to item 12, resolution 2022-20 recommending approval of the Skyborne development, partial assignment and assumption agreement is recommended to adopt resolution 2022-20, recommended the approval of a partial assignment and assumption of public water system improvement and water service connection fee credit reimbursement agreement authorizing uh, Skyborne Ventures LLC to assign water connection fee credits to Gallery Skyborne Partners LLC as required by the third amendments to the public water systems improvement and water service connection fee credit reimbursement agreement for track 32030 uh, and complete with all exhibits. Uh, Arden, you're going to have to translate that for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it kind of feeds in, uh, you know, uh, this sounds complicated, but it's really procedural, ministerial in nature. We, by contract, we need to, they need our approval, they need our approval to assign these uh, uh, these meters. And so uh, this requirement is in the contract and I'll let Brian elaborate on that somewhat and let you know it's every time they get ready to have someone build on their property, then we need to go through this assignment process. Okay. Brian? Thank you, President Martin, uh, members of the board, staff. Uh, just a couple of key points before I start with a true discussion. First of all, there there was uh, obviously there's some text in that original agenda that's incorrect. It's no longer gallery. It's actually Lenar. So that's the first thing I want to mention. The second thing I want to mention is this is different than the agreement that you've seen previously. That agreement was talking about concessions or deals that were made part of the development agreement. This is a true assignment of development impact fees. What I mean by that is when Skyborne Ventures purchased the Skyborne development, if you will, from DR Horton, they received land in the engineering stuff that was done, plans, reports, things like that, infrastructure, and more importantly, at least for this item, is the, the development fees uh, that was negotiated as part of the development agreement. Those fees specifically, in this case, water fee credits, uh, are compensation for specific water improvements that not only benefit the development, also the district. In this particular case, they did a couple of reservoirs, they did a transmission main, they also built a well, all of that totaled around $13 million, just short of that. So ever since this development started, they've been basically taking out and paying development impact fees with their meter when they buy their meters out of that $13 million. So when they bought, and I say they, when Lennar Homes purchased what we consider Village 2, 108 lots from Skyborne, they basically want to transfer what's in that fee credit to Lennar. We are, we are the ones that hold on to that that credit, if you will. So we're involved by this assignment to say that that's okay, because the agreement is actually between Lennar and Skyborne. So from that perspective, we're a third party just allowing this assignment to happen. This is only water. Sanitary is handled a little bit differently. It's an agreement between those two, but we may work through that when we're looking at the next agree next amendment to the original development agreement. So there are a lot of moving parts to this, but hopefully that clarifies. This is just the assignment of development fees that we've had as a credit toward the development itself. Okay. This is go ahead, Arden. Uh, this is a process we'll go through every time they get ready to move and build in the, but. It's, so you'll see this back on the agenda again as we as we move forward with that development. Very good point. We've looked at Village One. This is Village Two, and there's ten specific villages within the Skyborne development. Okay, um, Director Sewell, any comments or questions? Thanks, Director Duncan. Any yes. Or comments? Uh, this transfer of title, whether it's paper or or whatever, this doesn't affect their bond at all, does it? Doesn't relieve that umbrella of that bond. No, it does not. No, no. Director Cro Grasha, any any comments or questions? I have uh, no questions or comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice President Wright, none. And I have none. So thank you. Uh, moving on to item 13, Mission Springs Water District Regional Water Reclamation Facility update. Anything new on that? Well, yes, we're we're 
it is amazing. I've been out a couple of times and, you, and if you think during the uh, groundbreaking, it looked amazing, you should see it now. There are, there's a lot of rebar and a lot of construction that's going on, but I'm gonna let Steve uh, present to you the progress that we're making. Okay, okay, Steve, you have the floor. All right, thank you, General Manager Wallum. Uh, good afternoon, President Martin and members of the board. I'm gonna run through a quick uh, slideshow on the treatment plant in just a second here. And I have a short time-lapse video it really just highlights the overall progress at the site over the last uh, month since the June board meeting. Uh, a couple of procedural items first regarding the other ancillary components to the treatment plant project. The conveyance line, the final design package has been completed by the consultant and staff is working on preparing the final bid package and that's expected to go out to bid in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's good progress there. In addition, the area M2, um, where the staff is completing the final plan check for that this week. That will go back to the consultant and we expect to have that final bid package in about a month um, and be able to put that project out to bid as well. And again, that's gonna be constructing the, the conveyance line is gonna be delivering flows from the Dos Palmas lift station to the regional plant and the area M2 collection systems over off of Dillon Road and Bubbling Wells. And that will be a septic to sewer component that is going to abate over 400 septic tanks and construct the backbone uh, sewer collection system. Um, I did have a check-in call with the State Water Resource Control Board this afternoon, uh, checking in on the status of the grant and funding agreement. Um, I was notified that the contracting department is finishing up the agreement this week. From there, it routes back through the different um, legal, environmental, and finance departments for a final QAQC uh, before it goes in front of the assistant deputy director, then to Mission Springs to review, um, make any potential changes or comments, and ultimately will be in front of you for approval. Uh, we expect to have that sometime in August, which means we'll likely be bringing that in front of you uh, by September uh, for approval. Um, so if there are, are there any questions on that before I jump into the fun uh, slideshow portion? Hey, any questions from the board? Director Russian, any questions? No questions, just thank you very much for the update. That really okay, uh, anything further uh, from our general manager? Nothing. Okay, you go into the other part of your presentation then. Okay, will do. Thank you, uh, President Martin. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so um, I'm not gonna bore you with the overview. I'll just get right into it. Um, the plant drain pump station uh, slab on grade pour was completed. So that's the base slab for the plant drain pump station. Um, so you can see the concrete being pumped into the uh, formwork and rebar down at the bottom. In the background, you can see the beginning of the floor for the treatment tanks, the four SBR sequence batch reactor treatment tanks. Those are also all the lab, um, rebar is being laid for those and all the forms for the construction joints are being laid out. Um, after the pour was completed on June 14th, um, they quickly cover everything with these what are called thermal blankets. These thermal blankets really help control the overall temperature of the concrete. Um, that's one of the biggest components of not just working in a desert climate, but working um, uh, with concrete of this thickness, you know, these walls and slabs are all three feet thick and some as high as much as five feet thick. Um, there's a lot of heating that goes on during that concrete curing process. Um, so the contractor is doing everything they can to help mitigate that during construction. If you have excess heat, it could lead to concrete degradation, failures, cracking, so on and so forth. So this is a very large component of the construction of this plant is to ensure that the concrete is poured and maintained at a correct temperature as it cures. Um, after that process is complete, they'll, they're in the process now, or you can see here, they're stripping the forms and getting ready to build that rebar up the rest of the way for this pump station, which is about 30 feet deep in total. And I'll have some photos in a few minutes of the rest of that process. Um, here you'll see, this is going to be the slab for the big um, SBR treatment tanks. This is where the majority of the treatment process will happen. These will be four rectangular tanks going across your screen from left to right. Um, they're about uh, 120 feet long, uh, 20 feet wide and, or excuse me, 30 feet wide and 20 feet deep. Uh, you can see here kind of at the bottom of your screen, 
there is a significant amount, close to 100 conduits, electrical conduits that need to kind of intertwine and weave through that bottom slab and get to where they need to be to help control the equipment and monitor the treatment process during or once it's in operation. Uh, so it's a very, very complex, very elaborate process um, as it's going through. You can see here uh, the rebar crews are now laying the top mat. Um, this, this again, this slab is about three feet thick. So there's a bottom um, rebar mat that goes in. The diameter of those rebar anywhere from a half inch to one inch in diameter. Um, and again, they're setting the top mat here. Um, additional um, rebar crews completing um, all the rebar embedments. Um, we began work on the on administration and operations building, grading and electrical trench. Um, so that starts with uh, over excavation, confirming that the subgrade is of sound nature and then building that back up and compacting and wetting it so that it's um, able to have a slab port on it in the near future. Um, there are some large um, concrete trenches that go from the operations building into the SBR tank that uh, blower conduits, electrical conduits will all be ran through. Um, that's working there. You can see in this photo, again, these are electrical duct banks. Those are six four inch conduits that will all be concrete encased as part of the um, control and electrical equipment that goes to and from um, the operations building and the SBR tanks. Um, and then over the last two and a half weeks, um, the contractor JF Shea has been working on forming and pouring the plant drain pump station walls. Um, this is about 30 feet tall, the structure that you see in front of you, and again, about three feet thick. So um, they're working on both the inside, uh, interior and exterior rebar mats. Um, you can see the rebar crews again, um, they're working their way up the wall, laying all of the rebar. Um, the crane in the background is actually bringing in a big segment of that rebar to be put into place. Um, from there, I, I wanted to show you this photo. Part of that thermal control plan that I mentioned is we have cooling pipes that run through these three foot thick walls. So you see all those white conduits or white pipes. Those are just you know half inch um, PVC pipes that run through there that the contractor can circulate water through to help control temperatures and mitigate any um, addition or uh, too much heat in the concrete curing. Uh, in addition, there's you know a, a pipe penetration, so that'll be a pipe that will ultimately go through through this three foot thick wall. Um, this is the exterior form now. So now the, that's going to help uh, shore up and now the concrete will be bet uh, poured between these two sandwich forms. Um, the pour started at about four in the morning um, last Thursday, uh, a week ago, or excuse me, last Friday. Um, and then uh, the forms were stripped as of yesterday um, and it's gotten its, uh, sorry, last Thursday and then they stripped the forms and they're getting ready to start forming up the rest of the pump station that will be poured. Um, but again, these are about 30 foot tall uh, walls that you see in front of you. Um, and this is kind of a general site overview of where the plant's at as of uh, July 6th. Um, and so with that, I just want to run through a quick, um, a quick uh, time lapse. Video, bear with me to get that set up. Okay, um, so this is about uh, early to mid June, and this is right when they're finishing the excavation. And um, sorry, that's running faster than I wanted it to. Um, you'll see this is kind of day by day. It takes uh, snapshots every 15 minutes, and you'll see that they've completed all the excavation. They're starting to lay all the rebar down that bottom mat for the big SBR tanks. Now they're going to start forming up this kind of checkerboard pattern where they do their concrete pours in different segments. Um, on the bottom left of the screen, you see the plant drain pump station slab was poured. The thermal blankets are on there for several days while it cures. And then again, continued forming, pouring, laying conduits now. Those, uh, all those gray pipes are all the conduits running through the slabs. And then um, now you'll start to see the walls on the plant drain pump station go up on the left-hand side of your screen and continued work on the SBR slab. So you really get to see the magnitude of what's happening on the project on a day-by-day -day basis. I, I like to think looking at this time lapse, uh, it's pretty impressive to see it go up and actually see the magnitude of this project. And you know, it, it really goes to show what what you're really getting for the cost of this project at, at $41 million. Um, it, it is.
quite intense. Um, and with that, I will end my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, Director Grasha, any comments or questions? A couple of questions. Um, when, when finished, how, uh, where will the grade rest along that? Uh, I, I see you've got it below grade. Is that building up so that it eventually becomes above grade or how, what, what am I missing there? Um, so that pump station that I mentioned, that's about, that will stick out about anywhere from six to eight feet outside of the finished grade. So the operations building will be next to that on grade and that will be about six or eight feet above it. Um, as you kind of work your way to the, to the other sides of the SBR tank, you'll actually be about four feet above grade. So if you were standing next to it, you could actually get in and physically see the treatment happening um, without being on a ladder or a scaffolding or anything like that. Great. And so if, would, would it be, uh, uh, as an example, would you consider the roadway at grade or, or is there, are we changing that uh, from the natural, uh, I'm, I, I'm just surprised that looks like it's, you know, we're building down and not up. I, I'm just thinking of flood, uh, you know, flooding. I don't know what the floodplain is there, but it seems like that was something that's part of the uh, design of it. And I just wondered where, where that would end up occurring if there is flooding. Uh, great question, Director Grasha. Overall, the main pad, that the site that we're working on is built up about five feet taller than the natural grade around it. Okay. That gives us that flood protection. There's a, a, a drainage ditch that goes around the outside, a natural drainage ditch, ditch to intercept any flows coming towards the site, and it puts them back out, back into the natural channel, um, and it, it has a dissipation area where it actually puts the flows back out exactly how it would have been during a normal rainfall event. Um, but again, the site is about five feet above, and I'm kind of saying that most of the tank is four to, four to eight feet outside of that. So, so most of what we're looking at won't be visible someday soon, I guess. Correct. Yeah, it's gonna, it's all gonna get backfilled. Um, you know. And uh, you mentioned a number, 41 million, which I was pleasantly surprised to hear. Did something? Uh, uh, did we get good news that I didn't hear about? Uh, that's the that's the construction cost of the treatment plant only, not the conveyance line and not the M2 collection system. Okay. Well, I was I was under the impression that was in the 50 plus range, and that was why I hadn't heard. I heard, I remember we were at 30 million, then we were at another number, and then we were at 51 or 54 million, and that's when we voted on it, and I was like, I, I don't know if this is, a, but anyway, so is it, are we settling at 41 million as the expectation now? Yes, the contract that was awarded to JFA was 40 million 900,000 and change. Oh. Um, so that is the construction contract just for the treatment plant only. Um, the conveyance line that I mentioned that will be bid separate. That's, uh, you know, I don't want to speculate on the cost with the way the market is right now. Our engineer's estimates around six to seven million for that, or that's the engineer's estimate. Um, so those, we'll see what those costs are when they come in. Um, but the treatment plan alone, like I said, we only awarded 40, for just under 41 million to JFSHA to complete it. Great. And when uh, you uh, spoke in terms of the uh, um, grants, we've got 16 million, right, to apply to it now. It sounded like you're hot on the trail for what I, I guess sounds like full funding. So does that, uh, uh, that full funding number for the uh, plant alone or will that uh, uh, will be, we be able to uh, include the two other components into that? Uh, so Director Garasha, that the, so the entire program with all the staff costs, construction management costs, everything together is around 68 million and the uh, the State Water Resource Control Board is proposing to give us a grant for the full $68 million amount. All right. Excellent news. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I know it's been, I, I've been a little sketchy on some of this stuff, but it's only because of so many other things flying around that uh, it, it's almost like swatting flies with this group. And it, uh, it starts to show in all aspects of my uh, time here on the board. So I apologize for those misunderstandings. You're doing a great job for the district. And I hope that uh, uh, the public is aware of that and going forward the uh, uh, benefit to our public because of this uh, project is uh, can't be calculated in words uh, it's, it's going to uh, uh, really be uh, important for the watershed and i'm looking forward to seeing this completed and uh, 
uh, having the first inflows. I want to be there uh, and be part of the ribbon cutting when that happens. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, anything further? Mr. None, none for me, sorry. Okay, uh, Director Sewell, any questions or comments? Uh, no, just a great presentation. And I really appreciate all the uh, video and photo documentation. Um, you know, it's still gonna be impressive when it's finished, but to see how far some of these tanks go down and just the scale of everything, it's uh, great that we have all of that. So thank you. Director Duncan. Uh, no, same as I said earlier on our admin building, uh, I'm glad it's progressing. You're doing what you gotta do, so keep going. Vice President Wright. Yeah, just thanks, Steve. Um, good job. Uh, it, I just ditto what everybody else said. I'm excited about the project. I, I would like sometime when, when you think it's appropriate, I'd like to go out and physically hey, take a tour when, when you feel it's ready for that. So thanks. I think that's a fantastic idea, Director Wright. It, it really is impressive and, and nice to see the magnitude in person. And all I can say with respect to comments on this project is ditto what the other directors have said. Um, good input on there. Uh, General Manager Wallum, do you have anything you wanted to add? Nothing more, no. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, we can skip over the Critical Services Center because we've already had that presentation. So moving on to the consent agenda, uh, we've got two items, uh, approval of the minutes for June 1st, June 16th, and June 20th, and uh, item 16, register of demands. Uh, take a look at that over the weekend, and we'll be voting on that on Monday. Okay, moving on to director's reports. Uh, does anybody want to give their uh, director's reports today? Monday. Monday, okay, Nancy? Yeah, no, Monday, Monday? Yeah. Ivan, Monday? Monday. And uh, Director Grasha on Monday, or you want to do it today? I, I'm having trouble, uh, and I, I, I don't think I have a report to give this. One. Okay, that's okay. All right, moving on to general manager's report. Um, Ace, um, I, um, I, again, I need to uh, uh, apologize, I guess, for a mistake that in um, not getting all of the items on, on the thurs this Thursday agenda's meeting. I have four more additional items that I would uh, that I'm going to bring to you on Monday. They're again mostly just procedural in, in nature. Uh, but they are, unfortunately they are time sensitive. You can take a look at them and we will include all the staff reports for your review over the weekend. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty simple and straightforward and you can ask any questions on Monday and if you want to table them or Take them off. That's your prerogative. Okay. But I'll I'll be including that with the new agenda tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Right. That's it. That's all I have. Um, before we go on uh, further to district council comments, I want to apologize to our district council, Peg Battersby. Uh, she had some comments uh, on on one or two of the items that we went over, and I didn't give her the opportunity to weigh in mm -hmm. on that. So, uh, uh, Peg, go ahead. Well, thank you, President Martin and members of the board. Could you speak I up a little bit louder or get closer to the microphone there? I'm sorry. I I don't know where the microphone is in my office. So <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, good afternoon. I, I think um, three of you know who I am pretty well. I don't think I've met directors Grasha or Sewell yet, but um, I am a member of your general counsel's law firm. And I have been um, involved with the, the matter that Director Grasha raised initially in his comments this evening or this afternoon. Our office has been in communication with the district attorney's office, both before your last meeting and afterwards. At your last meeting, if you look at your minutes from the meeting, there was an announcement following the closed session. I'm sorry, Pick. I can just barely hear I'm you. I'm sorry. There... there was an announcement following the closed session after last meeting. And I'm going to read it to you. There was a motion in favor of filing a motion to initiate quo warranto proceedings on behalf of the district with respect to Director Duncan and Director Grasha to determine whether they satisfy residency requirements within the division that elected them. The 
Our law firm has moved forward with preparing those documents. They'll be brought forward to your meeting on Monday. And the district attorney's office is aware of the process that is being followed by state law. It is the exclusive process for testing the qualification of elected officers to, to their positions. So I just wanted to let you know that we are moving it forward and it will be coming forward again on Monday. And um, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction here and with the board's direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Yeah. Okay, okay, and I, I, I want to make just one uh, notice. We can either do, uh, one thing I did forget is we were going to do the, uh, the uh, financial report on Monday since uh, Arturo is gone, but we could do the PR report also today if you want to do that. Yeah, or you can do it Monday. 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 Okay, Monday. we'll do it Monday. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. And uh, moving on to uh, director comments. I'm going to start off with uh, uh, Director Grasha. Go ahead with your uh, with your comments, director comments. Uh, I won't fall for that. I'll wait for you to complete yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, director Sewell. I had no comments. Thank you. Okay. Vice President Wright. Uh, no, no, no comments. Yeah, well, one, one, one small comment okay. on camp. We get we get these emails on camp, and uh, it looks like our uh, interest has gone up from 0 0.02 or whatever it was to 0.38. Am I reading that one right? Yeah, you mean you for as far as investments? Yeah, our invest camp investments, right? C A M P. No, okay. Well, I'll I'll talk to her. I think that's a little. Hi. I have, I have no idea. Yeah. Maybe it's what it. Maybe it's just what it's gone up to. Maybe we'll, we'll see. It might be. Okay. I'm, I would like to before I provide an answer. I want to be okay. sure I'm accurate. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'll ask Arturo. I should have waited till he was here. I also just wanted to. I read an article. There's an article about beer yeast can filter lead from water. It's a new. It's a new study they're doing. So I'm thinking that might be really important for people who have lead pipes in their homes and stuff. That could be really important. So hope it works out. Too. I know, yeah, really. <laughs> Flush the beer down the toilet. I don't know. <laughs> Anything else? No, thank you. I'll wait till Monday to do the rest. Director Duncan. All right. I have two things. This is, I think, installment or chapter number four in my uh, ongoing quest for a new home. Despite the best efforts, of two very mentally ill stalkers, Diane and I have been able to stick to our plan, very methodically comb through the Coachella Valley. Gosh, I can tell you how many times now, uh, bumper to bumper through the valley. Fourth of July, we found, and this is back to good news, bad news, like I, like I said before. Fourth of July, we found the perfect home in the perfect neighborhood at the perfect price. So we are now getting ready to be homeowners again. Okay, that's the good news. Bad news is this house is in Rancho Mirage. So I will be leaving the board. We're scheduled to close November, uh, November August 16th. And despite, um, Directors Grosh's comments, uh, I would welcome the board to continue verifying my address within my division right now. Um, because I do I do live within my division and all is good. Second thing, and I'll I'll make this statement and then I, I have a question to ask. So with all this, I'm leading up to a question. I have owned I, my wife and I have owned property in Idaho for a very long time. It's never been an issue. In the year 2000, we bought a brand new boat. Since then, we've been going to Lake Havasu, um, spending most of the summers there, sometimes renting a home, sometimes leasing home long-term. Never been a problem. This last year in October, 
the developer or builder finished our house, we have a vacation home in Arizona, which is totally legal, totally above board, didn't hide it from anybody, but we own property in Arizona. Director Grasha and Russell Betts got wind of it and decided to make it into something that it's not. They have complained, filed complaints, called every news agency, every political advocacy group, uh, the DA's office. They have filed complaints with everyone they know of. I could personally care less. I know I'm in the right. The problem is every time a complaint is filed, every time a news report goes out, whatever the case may be, Mission Springs Water District now gets letters and phone calls, which we turn over to the attorneys and staff time. So what I would like to know, and this is not just for my own benefit, I think our customers deserve the right to know this. I know you can't get it by Monday, maybe by next board meeting. If you could tell me how much Steve Grasha and Russell Betts have cost this district on a wild goose chase that has gone nowhere, I would like to know that, please. And that's the end of my comments. Okay. And I have nothing uh, to comment on. Uh, there will be no closed session this today on Monday. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.